Hi, everybody. Welcome. My name is Melanie Brooks, and I am the audience coordinator at the Bangor Daily News. I am joined tonight by my colleague, Conrad Lum, and we are so excited to welcome Richard Blanco to BDN Events Online. It was just about this time last year that Richard joined us in Bangor for a live reading from his book, How to Love a Country. And we are so thankful that he's willing to join us again, this time virtually. Selected by President Obama as the fifth inaugural poet in US history, Richard Blanco is the youngest and the first Latino immigrant and gay person to serve in such a role. He was born in Madrid to Cuban exiled parents and raised in Miami. And for the past 12 years about, he has made a home in Bethel, Maine. Negotiating cultural identity characterizes his four collections of poetry, How to Love a Country, City of a Hundred Fires, Directions to the Beach of the Dead, and Looking for the Gulf Motel. He has also authored the memoirs for all of us, One Today, an inaugural poet's journey, and the Prince of Los Cocuyos, a Miami childhood. Cocuyos, a Miami childhood. For those in you, of you in the audience tonight who are BDN subscribers, welcome. Thank you for your support. And a big welcome to all of you who, who may be joining us for our BDN events online meetups for the first time. I hope it's not the last time. Uh, we have partnered with Left Bank Books for this event. They are an independent bookstore in Belfast, Maine. So if you were looking for Richard's books, contact them. They have some signed copies. You can visit leftbankbookshop.com. So many of you have probably used Zoom sometime in the last few months. I'm just going to point out a few things. You're all muted. Um, and that is so that we can hear our special guest. Um, Conrad and um, Richard are going to be conversing back and forth. Conrad has some questions for him. Richard's going to read some poems, but we want to hear from you as well. So if you wouldn't mind sending in your questions for Richard using the chat function, it's at the bottom of your screen and there's a little chat bubble. Um, if you could send in your questions that way, I can um, ask Richard on your behalf. Just makes the flow a little bit easier for our events. So Conrad will be taking over from here and I will be moderating your questions as they come in and I'm excited to get started. So let's begin. Um, well, you know, as far as a daily life, uh, the life of a writer is kind of solitary anyway and also living in Bethel, Maine. Uh, we're only 2,500 people, and really the state of Maine, really, right? Our population density is so low. Uh, so life hasn't changed on a day-to-day -day basis that much. Um, I think what's been different for me is that, um, uh, as with uh, How to Love a Country, a, a, lot of the, a lot of the poems that I've been writing lately are very topical, uh, centered around issues, uh, centered around current events, and um, I was really had a difficult time writing about um, uh, about the pandemic because in a way it's uh, it's this moving target and everything it's, I mean, it's something you know when we have when we have something happen we clearly deal with it and then there's an aftermath right like a 9-11 or or something like that um and so it's always this constant moving moving target finally wrote something down that got, got published uh, a couple of weeks ago in the atlantic about the about thinking about the future of post a post pandemic world because uh, i also don't don't uh you know i always write a lot more out of memory than i do uh, sort of like fermenting like sort of for me poetry is a little more like wine <laughs> as to sort of ferment a little bit so that was that was different uh it taught me it was different for me in that sense um other than that um yeah just watching like i guess many of us watching so many things unfurl and in a way being completely terrified, uh, shocked, and in an, in an odd way, and maybe this is just poets because as I'd like to say, when things are bad, poets always find the silver lining. When things seem to be good, poets always find what's not what's not working. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, but there is sort of this idea that a little bit of a paradigm shift of what's happening with all this confluence of of, of just making us reevaluate so many things from, well, obviously race, but also just reevaluating class, uh, how we how we 
interact with our communities, uh, thinking about how we value each other. Um, um, also, um, the fragility of all our systems and, and really just all those things, I think, that are that have just meshed into this big firestorm of, um, of, of feelings. That sort of brings us to um, the first audience question that we got um, submitted by Tom Maycock uh, before this event. He wanted to know, have protests specifically given you any new themes to write about? Um, uh, I think a lot of a lot of the poems that I've written in this book um, dealt were the first times that I gave myself permission to talk about um, uh, race. Uh, and dive into it in ways that I hadn't before. Um, I am a, um, you know, as I like to call myself, as a, it's a term I borrow from Julia Alvarez, as she's a white woman of color. And in a way, I, I am a white man of color because the world perceives me racially as white, but of course, culturally, I am of color. Um, and, uh, and so I've never really uh, sort of felt that I had the right to voice anything. And so the protests have been very inspiring uh, because I think, everybody's realizing that race is not just an African-American problem, <laughs> that it's all, or, you know, it's our collective problem, right? It's our collective history, it's our collective issue. Um, and to see the demographics of, uh, has been very inspiring to see that everybody's out on the street, right? Um, I think it was, I don't know, I've wanted to watch so much news lately, but um, a commentator was saying how different, how very, how different these protests are compared to the protests of the '60s, where the demographic was much more, you know, was much more had much more defined, right? Um, where here you have everyone from, you know, from uh, from millennials to um, you know to senior citizens to um, uh, immigrants to all kinds of ethnic backgrounds, race, etc., um, out in the street. Um, so, what I know of country, the first poem that you're going to read is is in a way. I, I guess you could you could say that it, in a way it's about the talk. That um, it starts well. It 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 ends that way anyway. So I'm, I'm I don't want to spoil it for anyone. I'm gonna I'll, uh, we'll get to it in a minute. But um, one question I had is whether um, whether you feel that uh, the talk that has begun in that poem is is um, something that is broadening now is, is something that is percolating throughout the culture? Um, yes, I mean, I think we probably feel that way. I think my, where I found sense of danger is as we've had talks about, you know, gun violence and we've had talks about race before, um, this seems to be sticking. Um, and it's interesting because it's, I think of the, a confluence of, of the pandemic where in a way that's made us pause or given us time to ironically, despite all the apprehension and shock and fear of something we've never faced before, at least not in this generation uh, or the last couple of generations has given us time to sort of pause on, on, on race. And so I'm thinking the conversation is different this time. I hope it doesn't go away. Uh, again, I think also from what I've been seeing, it's no longer just, Finally, Americans are realizing it's no longer that really the racism is not African Americans' problem; it's everybody else's problem, <laughs> in a way, right? Um, so, um, so I think that conversation um, has definitely uh, uh, has definitely moved. Uh, the needle has definitely moved. I think um, in ways that we're seeing across the board with advertisers, with um, uh, finally, a reckoning with our history uh, on so many different way levels and in so many different ways. So, yeah, uh, but that it's not to say that that talk hasn't had hasn't been happening, or I should say that people haven't tried to have that talk. We've been trying to have that talk for decades, right, for centuries. <laughs> um, so, yeah, um, and that's just part of a democracy is to continue the conversation to continue shape reshaping the narrative. So um, yeah, that's what uh, this poem is in a way about. Um, this poem was actually, um, the White House had asked me to write three poems for the inauguration. Uh, this was the very first poem I wrote. Um, the one I read was the second one uh, that I wrote. Um, and this poem takes us sort of, not inspiration, but it's metaphor from, 
um, thinking about our relationship with our country, <coughs> with our nation, <coughs> sorry, in that there's parallels in the ways that we engage with romantic relationships or friendships or, you know, we meet, we're infatuated, we're in grade school, we kind of <coughs> are sort of a little innocent about it, then we learn some truths, then we get angry, then we, <coughs> we um, say it say what we need to say and eventually come to some kind of mature love and understanding um, of a relationship with our country. So it kind of traces um, that throughout the poem. Let me make sure I don't choke again. Yeah. <clears throat> I might need my glasses for this. The sun is coming down <laughs> in my office. Um, what we know of country. Those picture books of grade school days Pilgrims in tall hats, their gold buckled shoes I wanted so badly. White wigged men standing tall in velvet curtained rooms, holding feathers in their hands, inked words buzzing off the page into my heart's ear. Life, liberty, happiness, for we, the people, singing of shining seas crossed, the spacious skies of a God blessed land, when a song and a book were all we knew of country. I've forgotten the capital of Vermont and Iowa, but I remember my eyes on a map mesmerized by faraway cities, towns I couldn't pronounce or believe the vast body of this land belonged to me and I to it. The Rockies' spine, <clears throat> blue, sta blue stare of the Great Lakes and the endless shoulders of coastlines, the curvy hips of harbors, rivers like my palms, lines traced with wonder from beginning to end, the tiny red dot of my heart marking where I lived when what I knew of country was only what I read from a map. I wanted to live in the house I dreamed from television, cushy sofas, crystal candy dishes, mothers who serve perfectly roasted turkeys with instant stuffing, children with allowances and perfect teeth, fathers driving teal blue cars with silver fins to some country club I'd surely belong to someday. Though the gunfire, blood of war beamed into my bedroom, though I fell asleep, though our men from the moon landed on my roof with empty promises from space, fantasy was still all I could believe of country. I didn't want to change the channel, but I did. I lifted the shades, let light shine on the carpets stained with lies I'd missed, and saw the dust of secrets settled over the photos. The house began to creak, fall apart around me, alone for years, waiting at the kitchen table, the last to know, asking my reflection in the windows, how could you, America? With no answer, for all I knew of country was my hurt and rage. But home was home. I dusted off the secrets, cleaned up the lies, nailed the creaky floorboards, Set a fire and set a fire and sat with history books I'd never opened, listened to songs I'd never played, pulled out the old map from a dark drawer, redrew it with more colors, less lines. I stoked the fire, burning on until finally, okay, nothing's perfect. I understood. I forgive you, America, I said, and forgiveness became my country. I stayed, you stayed, we stayed for our boys and girls returning as heroes, some without legs or arms, for our challenger and towers fainting from the sky, for the terrified lives of the big easy stranded like flightless birds on roofs, for the sea that drowned our north, but, but <clears throat> we swept each grain of sand back to shore, for the candles we lit for our 20 children of Sandy Hook, feeling what we've always felt, to know a country, takes all we know of love. Some days better than others, but never easy. To keep our promise every morning of every year of every century and wake up, stumble downstairs with all our raging hope, sit down at the kitchen table again, still blurry eyed, still tired and say, listen, we need to talk. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Thanks. So, so you, you said earlier that um, 
you you observe that uh, during good times, poets uh, notice everything that's going wrong, and um, and that uh, during bad times, you you tend to look on the bright side. So, um, do you think that that poets' jobs job descriptions change in a, in a time of unprecedented tumult like we're living through right now? Do you think that do do you feel that there's a different responsibility when you uh, when you use your voice? Um, I think that responsibility has always been there to use my voice differently because what poetry is trying to do is use language or surface language uh, that is not out there um, or as a way of shaping dialogue, of, uh, as a way of having different kinds of conversations. I would say that certainly my writing has changed after the inauguration just because of assuming more of a civic uh, role or, or understanding the civic role of poetry, going back even to my cultural roots uh, in, in Cuba and Latin America where poetry and literature are much more present in the day-to-day -day lives of people and their consciousness and not any poets go to jail, you know. Um, uh, so, um, so I have started that shift, but I guess what I want to say is that even you know, even when we're voicing things, we try to voice it in a way that adds to the conversation rather than just repeat what's being said. So I think, for example, um, um, again, and, you know, voice, it's the poets are always sort of seeping through and looking at something that perhaps is being missed. So yes, there is all this amount of protest of voicing uh, going on. Um, I always, I always think that a poem of protest of political poem is really, job is really to then offer us a way out offer us a, a, a hope offer us some other way to to move the conversation not to not to ignore it and certainly to call attention to it uh, but then what's next right because we're kind of always thinking well okay that's fine but what are we not thinking about right what do we what are we, what is not the expected uh, angle or conversation that's happening so um, so that might be the next the next way in which I think poets are going to respond to what's going on now is like, well, let's take this moment and let's again, like we we're saying, let's not let's not forget it because we can we can have this sort of very um, <clears throat> this great talk that we're having right now, uh, and poets are going to keep on reminding us that the conversation isn't over. Right? Um. Claudette, if I can interrupt Conrad, Claudette had a question about, um, she wants to know who made the decision, which of your three poems would be the one that was read at the inauguration? Um, the president, um, as far as I was told. <laughs> uh, he uh, personally read the poems and was, and picked the one um, which was interesting um, because the third one was, was a much more personal poem and uh, and then one that I was kind of rooting for. But then I realized also that the, the poem I did read was really the right poem to read. Um, but yeah. <laughs> That's great. Um, so um, the poem that you're going to read next, Easy Lynching on Herndon Avenue, it, it does exactly what you were just describing, uh, the role of a poet as it makes visible the pain of a community that that can be invisible to some. Can you can you tell us a little bit about where that work began in a very practical sense? Uh, just how did you hear about the events described in the poem? Um, where did sure. it begin? Sure. So um, if you'll allow me to share a screen, am I allowed? Can I get permission to do that? <laughs> I think so. Why don't you try? And if if not, then um, not quite yet. Know. No, not yet. Well, okay. try, keep Let me on see trying. If I can work on that. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, the there are twelve poems in the new book and How to Love a Country that actually began as a project back in around 2014, 15. No, about 2014, and it was a, a collaborative project with Jacob Hesler, uh, a landscape photographer, uh, right here from Maine, from Camden, um, and we set about. A, a, on a, the collaborative project was titled Boundaries, and it was 12 photographs and 12 poems on the theme of boundaries. Uh, and again, like I said, poets are thinking, you know, 2015, we have an African-American president. I mean, 2014, it was still like thinking we'd turn a corner. We did turn a corner. 
Um, and so, um, but we knew there was something, something going down. <laughs> something was going to go down soon. So this, the book seems like it was like published, you know, after the 2016 election and it was actually began a long time ago. Anyway, uh, one of those photographs is uh, a photograph, a present day photograph of the last recorded lynching uh, in the United States, operative word meaning recorded, um, which has an interesting story behind it. And it was, so this is my poem in response to that photograph. Um, and it was a very, very hard poem to write. As I said earlier, um, I had never given myself permission to speak about race. And this is the poem that did it because I had, I guess to do that, I had to realize that I myself had some smudges, I wouldn't say racism, that's a big word, but certainly prejudice, uh, mostly just learned, and I think we all do, you know, learn from, um, you know, older generations, just from street talk, and, and you don't realize how much this is, um, it has effect, you know, is in your brain, is it's noise in your brain, and so, and how much in some ways it does affect, um, you know, your inability to sort of speak up, um, so, you know, that snide remark in the elevator that we won't say anything about. I, I, and, it, you know, this just changed my whole relationship. With race. I just, I, I, you can't assume because I'm not black when you look at me or I'm not African-American that you can say crap like that in front of me, right? So I call people on it all the time now. Um, so it's, it, that is kind of interesting. And, and this poem made me realize, personally, it's not in the poem per se, but, you know, stuff my grandmother used to say and things like that, you know. Again, racism would be a, diff a harder word, but certainly prejudice is smudges of that stuff. And also how in a way, when we don't recognize that those things in us, in a way America hasn't recognized it in itself, right? We've kept on sweeping, we've kept on sweeping race under the rug and under the rug. And yes, it comes up and then we sweep it back over again. So um, just want to show you the photo here. Um, everybody see that? Yeah. So, um, so the poem speaks to that too, that in a way how there's all this negative space in the photo, you could drive by this street and never realize what happened here, right? And, and the year it happened in, which might catch, a spy, might catch the readers by surprise. Um, so yeah, it's kind of multi-layered in thinking about that um, question of the conversation of race Easy lynching on Herndon Avenue. What I'd rather not see isn't here. No rope, no black body under a white moon swaying limp from a tree. No bloody drops of dew on the 21st of March, 1981. That's in another photo, like a dozen other photos I've gaped at, wanting, not wanting to turn away from the snap necks of the hanged and the mob's smug smirks, asking myself, how could they? Why? Questions not here, not in this photo, a crisp and tranquil snapshot, murder washed out by time, history left uncaptured. What's left now is easier on our eyes, only pale morning light seeping blue into the sky, a backdrop to the necks of tree bows bowing like swans, innocent of any crime on Herndon Avenue, pictured like any other street, clean sidewalks, no blood, utility poles strung with wires, no rope, a few pavement cracks, no broken bone body. Easier to imagine only this, groomed children waiting for the school bus grinding to a halt that March morning, the 21st, 1981. Their backpacks zipped with undoubtable history and equations, cartoon lunchboxes filled with fresh ham sandwiches and sweet grapes. Sport coat fathers dashing to work, worried about paychecks and the greenness of their lawns. All, days, all day mothers left tending silk pillows never fluffed enough, scrubbing sinks never white enough, wiping windows never spotless enough. Easier not to ask if anyone saw him, if anyone knew the boy whose mama had named Michael, Michael Donald. Easier to think no one was friendly with Mr. Hayes and Mr. Tiger Knowles, who on the night of March 21st, 1981, drove around looking for something black to kill. They spotted him, age 19, walking home, the body strangled him first, then slit his throat. The blood chose a tree to hang him. The rope, Herndon Avenue, 1981.
81. Which tree was it that shook with his last breath? Easier not to look for it, not find it, not make ourselves imagine Michael still on Herndon Avenue, his death still alive since March 21st, 1981. Easier not to look at his shut eyes, wondering what his favorite color or superhero was, if he liked to skateboard or draw, if he heard his mama's cries, my boy, Jesus, my boy. Easier to believe the last words on the lips of his murderers must have been, forgive us. To trust this kind of thing doesn't happen anymore. Stay blind, no rope, no blood, no body to the life of a boy named Michael. Invisible in this photo, that is, until we dare to look hard and deep and long enough. Thank you so much, Richard. That's um, sobering and, um, and an important reminder. Um, yep, yep, yep. And I think at the time I wrote, of course, like I said, Obama was president. Uh, and a lot of us had a, a blind side to think that, you know, the, the race question uh, issue of race had just sort of been, been dealt with. <laughs> and I even asked my students today, today in, in college and at the university, and there's still this predominant, they walk out of high school still thinking the Civil War settled the question, therefore everything's fine, and the issue of race in this country is, does, is, 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 is not white people's problem. It's, and it's amazing, even today, how this is our sensibility that we don't understand the history that happened since the Civil War, the, the systemic oppression of, between zoning laws. I mean probably preach to the choir at this point, but yeah. <laughs> Ellen shared in the chat that she said, this poem guts me every time he reads it, and I don't think that she's alone. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, Ellen. <laughs> so if, if reading gives us the privilege of, of being in dialogue with the dead, um, what other poets do you find yourself in dialogue with? Who's Who's in your... Who's in Richard Blanco's personal canon? Um, you know, that, that kind of changes from time to time. Um, um, you know, um, right now, uh, to be more topical, I've sort of discovered, again, I guess this gets back to the issue also of how, of race in America, or racism rather. Um, but I'm discovering like poets like June Jordan that were speaking about these things like, you know, you could read that poem today, and it like it 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 sheds light on what's going on in those poems that were written like 20 years ago, or 25 years ago, or even 30 years ago. So, um, so I'm looking a lot at some of the you know going back all the way to Harlem Renaissance and thinking, my my God, we're just talking about this the, even then, and then also thinking about Black women poets right now, like June Jordan. Um, uh, so, so that's kind of a little bit of what I'm investigating right now. Um, as my mainstay, though, uh, you know, I, I guess my greatest influence has been Elizabeth Bishop, um, which is kind of, I think, surprises some people in that sense, because here's this little Cuban chubby gay kid from Miami. <laughs> um, but there is something to be said about um, also reading something that's not like you and having a dialogue. Uh, where you realize your comments shared humanity and a poet that you don't expect to find yourself in. And so in a way, Elizabeth Bishop, who actually lived in North Haven in Maine, um, uh, and also did Elizabeth Montgomery. So my two, my two Elizabeths, <laughs> when I went to North Haven for the first time, I almost kissed the ground. Um, <laughs> uh, but so I find that powerful. And I, and I like to share that with everybody because I, I would think that if I can read Elizabeth Bishop, sorry, I can read Richard Blanco and feel the same kind of, you know, universal grounding. Um, and uh, I think sometimes readers need permission to read outside of their own comfort zone. Um, so I just kind of turn the tables and say that. Not to, not to, not to say that it's some of my icons or people that give me permission to write like Sandra Cisneros, Julia Alvarez, um, among others, Luis Rodriguez, um, they serve uh, they serve not just in terms of their work itself, but also just as figures, as literary figures. They give me permission 
to keep on writing my, that first gave me permission to write my story and realized I didn't have to write about daffodils um, <laughs> in Miami where I'd never seen one. I never saw a daffodil until I moved to Maine. Um, <laughs> uh, so, but, you know, there's the different ways in which they are connected to me. Um, uh, we have a question from Linda. She says, given the power of language, what would you think about the United States adopting a new national anthem? Um, you know, it's really interesting. It's, there's, a, there's a great poem by um, Ada Limon that's called A New National Anthem or something like that. It's, I think you can see it online. It's widely online. Um, one of the poems in the book is uh, called America the Beautiful Again. Um, and my favorite song of all these kinds of patriotic songs, uh, go back to that one because it, uh, as I don't know if I know the fourth verse, but, <laughs> but certainly it's a celebration of beauty and nature and an invocation to, to be blessed, um, and not about bombs in the air. And like, so, um, I've often thought, uh, yeah, the America, the beautiful should be actually, if anything, I mean, if we're going to dip back into the old to the old stuff, um, I think it's a much more benign, <laughs> a much more poetic um, <laughs> national anthem. Uh, but yeah, that bombs bursting in air and the kind of, um, I don't know all the details of that, but I don't know if there's racist details or overtones, but I know it wasn't written under, it wasn't, it was written under sort of not, not the best of circumstances, if I remember correctly. <laughs> by people recovering from from warfare themselves yeah <laughs> yeah um so the next poem that um that you're going to read saint louis prayer before dawn um takes on an uh, a kind of incantatory quality um and there are uh, it's in interspersed with lines from prayers that that many of us will know. Um, so, which, which makes me wonder about your poetry is, is religion something that, um, something that you draw on um, frequently? And uh, if not, why not? Is it, is it something that you um, prefer to sort of set aside when you are, when you're thinking about poetry? Is it, um, is it something that you, uh, don't interact with directly yourself um, that often. What is it about about religion that um, that inspired this poem? And is is it something that you um, that you interact with often that um, that you uh, or that you prefer to set aside? Uh, sure. Um, so uh, I was I went to a Catholic Roman Catholic uh, school since kindergarten. <laughs> all the way through high school. Um, so uh, enough said about that. <laughs> uh, but I, outside of, uh, outside, there was a lot of positive things that came out of that. And it was sort of, did establish for better or for worse, a kind of a, kind of a moral compass, I guess, a kind of an ethical compass that I think stayed with me despite, despite its history and its misgivings and whatnot but more so i just love i love the ceremony of religion and whether that or whether that's um you know a, a, a buddhist mantra or whether that's uh i mean it's you know blessed be god blessed be his holy name bless this prayer the psalms you know there's a lot of prayer poetic quality because if you think about um if you think about the history of poetry right it's, it's oral tradition and it was really song and music and chanting for thousands of years before it was on a page and such was <laughs> church going right i mean they're like you know we, shakespeare didn't have a book signing after <laughs> after the place so um so i love how it has that oral quality that that invo invocation and that um beautiful language um and and proverbial language that's um also, uh, language that's, uh, there's a lot of wonderful metaphors and figurative language in, in, in religious speak or in spiritual speak. And so that's part of what's in this poem. But also this poem, it's a nod to how the civil rights movement is tied to, um, to religion, right? Um, and it's really interesting how uh, that, that, that tie, that, that, that the faith in that, that 
the faith of the community was also tied into this into the civil rights movement and it's really interesting i gotta say sometimes i met because of my sexuality sometimes i met in communities uh not so positively when i post something or do something that's really gay <laughs> and i asked my my anthropologist friend ethnographer friend ruth about that and she said well you know there's an inextricable sort of connection especially with the older generations between civil rights and religion and so like to accept one to sort of flounder to sort of mess with one is to mess with the other one belief system they're also tied together so this is a nod in a way to evoke that uh, to bring that into into uh, a poem about race. Um, and this was, uh, this was also a commissioned poem. So this was a project that we did called St. Art, uh, which was a street, uh, a street painter project uh, that we did poetry on. And then there was a big festival and it all had to do with this divide, which I learned a lot. Again, never learned this in school, right? You walk away from high school thinking, oh, the Civil War's over, everything's fine. Um, how the systemic, uh, by zoning laws, how the divide in St. Louis, you know, I mean, the Del Mar divide, it's, it's amazing where if you were, if you were black or African American, you couldn't own property past this line. So when you look at the statistics nowadays in terms of income, in terms of education level, in terms of everything, and it was just basically another way of, um, another form of oppression, another, another form of um, uh, systemic racism. Um, uh, that's still there to this day. Um, so anyway, this is took the form of a prayer. Uh, St. Louis prayer before dawn. Watch the dark sky mute amid the vigil of stars, a black and white prayer where there's hatred. Let me so love. Amen. Hear it above Delmar Boulevard with its black and white stripes that divide the city into black and white voices. A time to rend and a time to sow. Listen to its north side, the din of gunfire, the silence of boarded up windows, the vagabond weeds creeping through the floorboards of abandoned homes, still echoing with children who prayed every night. And if I die before I wake, and if I die before I wake, amen. Now listen to its south side, chit chat about vacation spots, stock tips, and the alabaster blooms of dogwoods and gardens tended to by the help the meek shall inherit the earth. Look into their shimmering windows, framing cocktail parties filled with platters of gourmet cheese, fresh cut flowers, and the bouquet of Merlot. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, amen. Don't close your eyes to the sooty plumes of smokestacks rising like sinister incense tarnishing the moon, where there is despair, hope, Compare it to the silver moonlight showering suburban rooftops, backyard decks, green lawns, and the luna moth's green angel wings. For it is in the giving that we receive. Amen. Churn with the Mississippi's waters as brown as the skin of the homeless with names, but no home except their shadows in an alley off Market Street. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Rest with them, trying to rest under the arresting rain of fluorescent lights falling 20 stories from locked off office buildings, empty of executives, but stocked with wealth. Easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Sleep past dawn with faces resting on tender pillows, asleep under thick comforters. Grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console. Amen. Wake up with faces on buses riding past the graffitied walls of their streets, marrying the truth of their lives on their way to ten boutique hotel rooms, wash shirts and press skirts, or cast concrete floors for luxury condos. Where there is doubt, faith. See the arch, not shimmering steel, but dull as nickel in the dark, a broken circle, a broken promise, not a gateway, but a gate closed on St. Louis, trapped in all its black and white. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, amen. Glory be waiting for the dawn. Glory be knowing the only dream worth dreaming is the one we dream in every color. 
where there's darkness, light. Amen. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, Alma had a question for you. She wants to know at what moment in your life did you realize that you were a poet? Actually, just about two weeks ago. Uh, <laughs> I'm not. I'm not being entirely facetious. Um, I to this till not too long ago. I, I mean, I. You know, you're a poet like you are a doctor, like you are an engineer. I'm also an engineer, like you are a nurse, like you are a teacher, like you are. There's no one moment where you just kind of say, oh, I'm finally a poet and I've arrived. There's always a good amount of healthy self-doubt or skepticism, a uh, good amount of um, hopefully a fair amount of ego <laughs> that makes us work harder. So it's really like every other career. There's days where you feel more in it. There's, you have good days as a teacher, bad days as a teacher, you have good days as a parent, bad days as a parent. So there's never really that one moment that you're completely sure. But there are, there are of course, seminal moments, right? Really key moments where you dive deeper and commit yourself more than you had before. Uh, one of those was when I was studying, uh, had was about to start studying uh, enter the master's program in creative writing. And of course I had read The Red ba Real Barrel by uh, William Carlos Williams uh, in high school, never thought anything of it. I'm like, duh, whatever. Uh, <laughs> um, and so I'm looking back through all these old poems that stayed in my mind or from my textbooks and I'm reading, so much depends upon a red wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater besides the white chickens. And I'm looking at my mother while I'm reading this um, in the kitchen of the, my childhood home cooking dinner like she's done every year for 30 or all my life, you know, almost what seems the same apron with her same, you know, dull knives, chopping onions and green peppers and making her. And I just realized so much depends upon my mother in her tomato stained apron chopping onions and I just realized my whole life depended on, on that moment and I wouldn't say that I knew I was a poet but I, I felt committed to poetry I kind of got poetry at that moment um why I'd say a couple weeks ago is because I don't know if my history is kind of odd I came to poetry through the back door I'm an engineer I've been a practicing civil engineer all my life um and so um I didn't start writing poetry until I was about 27 um and so I don't, I still said like, why am I a poet? We didn't even have books in my house. My parents didn't even speak English. The only books we had were like books on how to learn to speak English. <laughs> so we weren't a literary family. We're working class immigrants struggling to survive. We're no luxuries. We weren't talking about Picasso around the dinner table, much less Robert Frost or anything like that. Uh, but I realized at about the age of two or three, I already knew two languages. Um, I don't remember ever not knowing two languages. And I remember being completely fascinated as I look back now, completely fascinated by language and learning at an early age that language wasn't just a form of communication that I took, that we grow up taking for granted, but that it was a way of thinking. It was a way of breathing in the world. It's a way of living and the power of language to know that I, at some point I had a linguistic power over my parents who wouldn't speak English um and vice versa that they knew a world that i couldn't have access to because i wasn't as fluent in spanish my life wasn't being lived only in spanish and they had a different so anyway i just realized that when i came to when i when i wanted to do some creative i i turned to languages at first i was just exploring creative curiosities and just at 27 trying to be like bohemian the bohemian poet engineer <laughs> and, uh, i just started goofing around and i thought let me do something really artful artsy that i don't have no idea what it's about let's write poetry but now i realize that i guess it was always there that fascination with language and how language shapes uh our very being and our way the way we see ourselves and the way we see the people in our lives and the way we see the world and and hopefully that that the language has a power to do that uh, in in a positive way and as a gift to other people, to bring language to people that makes them think about their own lives in ways that they had never thought about it before. Claudette had a question about the, um, the St. Louis poem. Since it was commissioned, for which occasion did you first present it? 
um, well, we had that we had the festival, and so the the whole concert was actually quite quite interesting. Uh, there was there's actually a, a, a a twin poem to this. Well, not a twin, but there's a poem after dawn. Uh, so the idea was to uh, the poets to write uh, a poem of dark, darkness and lightness, the 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 after or the present and the possibility of the future, right? Um, and also, it was done with in combination with street painters, and they set up these huge canvases in a pretty famous park in St. Louis. Now I forget. And so what we did is one day we read the poems of darkness, and the and, a, and the Painters painted that shadow side of of the issues of St. Uh, Louis in respect to race, and then the next day we went and reread the poems of, uh, of hope of dawning of light, uh, and the painters, the street painters did that, and then at night uh, they pulled in all those canvases into a gallery, which are huge, right? Because these people are street painters, um, um, and then we had. Uh, and then we read the poems as well and had the larger community, more community involvement engagement. So that's how it was debuted. R Richard, um, so two of the poems that you've read tonight are, are um, poems that are in dialogue with other art forms. Um, and uh, I, I was reading through, I was reading through How to Love a Country. Um, and one of your poems, Leaving in the, in the Rain, Limerick, Ireland, quotes Pavese who said, you need a village if only for the pleasure of leaving it. Um, all of us have been, well, I, I would imagine that many of our audience as well as myself have been more or less unable to leave our village for a while. Um, the Bangor Symphony Orchestra uh, missed most of its last season. So how do you think the isolation that we're living with is, is going to change art, is going to change um, the, the things that cause us to get together in a place and see a thing or listen to a thing? Um, whether yours or others, how do how do you think that's going to affect um, the the communal aspect of art over the the next year, two years? Um, that's uh, you know I think again every artist will kind of think about this a little bit differently. Um, and I mean poets, arts are a reflection of consciousness of a larger consciousness. What happens? What's happening in the ground too? Right? We're kind of in a way, responding to to what's happening, but also pushing that, like I said, pushing the conversation or or working with that conversation to add to the con to the conversation. Um, uh, and I th I think if and what I'm saying, at least I, I maybe I can only speak for me, but I'm thinking what I'm sensing is that um, this this uh, rebirth or renaissance in really in really appreciating community. Um, so there's a great irony, like you said, is the pleasure of leaving, which is one of my favorite quotes ever. Um, and uh, it's just so ironic because I've, you know, it's like it's contradictory if you really think about it. But we, it, what it's also saying is that when we leave, we also also sort of take for granted what exists for us. Um, and so I have this poem in the new book called Imaginary Exile, which talks about imagining if I had to leave everything, this home in my home in Maine, and like my mother left Cuba, what would happen? And of course, there's this irony now that I'm at home, I'm, I'm in exile at home, in my very home, and like realizing that that's not enough, that home, the definition of home has become larger. And so um, something we kind of knew, but didn't always appreciate that, um, you know, home, as we know, is everybody in the community and that each of us contribute a part to that sense of community and place, an essential part, a practical part even. And uh, so I'm guessing that, you know, I think there'll be more attention paid to perhaps art that's a little more enco enc uh, encompassing, gregarious, uh, generous. Uh, I gotta say a lot of poetry in the contemporary vein can can not a lot, but I should say some. <laughs> um, as all the arts have, in a way, contemporary have have a t can have a the risk of being very myopic, right? Navel gazing, very sort of like, you know, for only this kind of certain understanding. It's certainly not where I've ever wanted my art to come from because of my background. Um, like Sandra Cisneros said, I I always wanted to write a book that my bus driver would read. <laughs> and she did. One day she got on her bus and the bus driver had a copy. <laughs> and that's kind of like, you know, that's kind of, so art, that I think there's going to be a, perhaps a more generous 
uh, understanding of what community is. And of course, all the topics that we talked about earlier that have come up um, in terms of race. And I, I think you probably see voices that have not spoken to race to start speaking about race, or I should say racism, it's the right word. Um, um dialogues between even even artists i mean artists have camps and they have you know um it's one of the things i'm like kind of like already getting a little irritated about. <laughs> not a little irritated but questioning right like you know there are there are having these poetry readings and not that i want to appropriate i will never know what it's like to be an african-american person much less an african-american man or teenager in this world but also, let's invite other people into that conversation for the dialogue's purpose, right? And I'm seeing where there's, there's maybe that I hope does start to happen conversations amongst artists themselves. And why haven't you talked? Why haven't we done? Why haven't we been paying attention to June Jordan, you know, in our in our in the academy, who is the equivalent of Adrian Reich, Reich, you know? I mean. And if you ask me, probably 10 times, <laughs> but don't quote me. Sorry, Adrian. <laughs> you know, like, why? So we have to, I think those kinds of things, like from the academy to who, who, who we're making art for, who do we think, uh, who do we include in that art, I think are questions that are happening um, personally uh, in artists. And also, again, it's a reflection of some of the versions of questions we're all asking ourselves. We have a question from Michelle, and she says, from your memoir, it seems you were a go-between between the old world of your parents and the new world of America. Is this also the role of the poet, a go-between between the old world and the new, especially in current times? Um, I, I, I think so, and I think so in, in, in in various ways. One is the, the work that poets leave behind. Like I was just saying, June Jordan, here's the record, right? Um, here it is, fresher, in a way, more relevant and, 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 and fresher than even maybe when it was there because maybe the, like, or, you know, well, to use a cliche, before, not before it's time, but certainly people weren't paying attention in the way that they do now. So there's, that's one part of it. That's how are you bridging the past? Because, I mean, that is the past, and, and, or even Harlem Renaissance poets, you know, that is the past, and the poet's work continues to do this bridging, right? This translating uh, to also make sure, and I, don't, I know this is a conversation that's been happening also in the news uh, and, and, and in other circles is like, uh, if we erase history, how do we preserve this history so that in a different way, that's not glorifying it, but also so that we don't repeat it, right? As, as, the, as the saying goes. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking like all these statues should actually be put in a, in, in a museum and contextualized so that kids can go to field trips and say, this is what happened. This is why they're here. This is why they've been taken out and not just sort of pretend again that it never happened, you know? I mean, so there's a lot of that conversation. But anyway, um, as far as um, another, uh, another facet of that for me is that I've always felt uh, that part of my role uh, and part of, to a certain degree, to varying degrees, different artists, um, whether that's a poet, a painter, a musician, is to be an emotional historian. So to, Part of why I started writing was because I wanted to tell the stories of my parents and my grandparents, uh, the emotional stories, right? Not the, this happened and then that happened and that happened, but their emotional lives, as well as my counterparts in Cuba, as well as the, my contemporaries, my Cuban American generation, the bridge generation, because there, there was never gonna be another generation like that. Right, that experience, and I wanted to record that emotionally, um, not in not in the way that a newspaper does, or in the way that um, um, uh, you know other forms of writing do, but in a way that only not even novels do, but in the way that poetry does, the emotional lives of of people, um, and in that way, I always yeah, I've always felt that personal charge. So I always write with the sense of I mean that was what was hard about writing my my. Uh, got to stop calling it the virus poem. It's called um, Say This Isn't the End. It was for, I imagine someone reading it a hundred years from now, 
to them for them to contextualize what happened. I mean, sort of thinking about how we, what do we know about, you know, the, the, the epidemic of 1918, right? Like, what do we know? We have no, no emotional history of that to know how to deal with it. So I thought, well, maybe someone will pick up this poem a hundred years again, if, if we make it <laughs> and see, this is what it felt like. This is what you're going to go through <laughs> and that's okay. And uh, here's the poem. And uh, so, yeah, that's always been a personal charge. Uh, and I think that's, that's an impulse in a lot of artists because they know that they're, they're writing or painting again, or singing in a, in a sense believing that their work will live on and tell the story that, you know, it is like a baton to me. And, I, and also when you realize in your life that you're born into a story, right? And, you know, until you're like in your early 20s when you are mid 20s, or in some cases, not until you're 50, <laughs> you realize you think you've made all these decisions in your life and it's your story and it's your major and I made myself, you know, I'm a self-made person and you don't realize you came in on the fifth act of the play, right? So much was predetermined for you by choices your parents and grandparents and great grandparents made. And so in a way, uh, you're, just, you're just here to hold that story for a while, add to it and pass it on for everyone else, uh, whether that's your own children or just the world in general. Uh, there's a great book called The Gift, and I forget the author now, but takes the concept of giving all the way from the sort of um, throughout history. It's quite a fascinating read anthropologically, and it talks about how artists have done that. Um, if you look at what it would remember about civilizations, um, um, I mean, with <laughs> no offense to the banker daily news, <laughs> but like, you know, we, or any newspaper whatsoever. But I mean, we go to Rome to look at the remnants of art, right? That's that's what sort of eventually that's our way back into the story, right? Uh, we go see the Colosseum. We go see you know these these. We go see the temples. We go see you know we go see the Sistine Chapel. You know we go see art because art is timeless and in a way by timeless means that it has it's a two-way street it moves to the future and also moves towards the past and recontextualizes our past like i mean when you if those of you who have been in the sistine chapel i'm like this is interesting <laughs> it's like michelangelo was pulling a joke on the vatican for like hundreds of years <laughs> and i was like hmm. That's interesting. <laughs> so I'm not going to go any further with that because I might get in trouble. But, <laughs> but yeah, I love that about art, and uh, and it's and yeah, I think I think we all do that in our personal lives to some degree. I think it's a human urge, a human need to take something, own it, and give it out, and give it, pass it on to someone. With the artist, it's just something that's really pronounced or maybe even exaggerated. Um, uh, that is our charge in a way. Like I say, my my children are my poems. Um, that's you know, and I love them all the same, <laughs> equally. <laughs> well, it's six o'clock. It's been an hour, and I just wanted to thank you, Richard, for coming and spending an hour with us tonight of your time. Uh, it was. So nice listening to you read those poems and talk about your work. And a big thanks to Conrad for helping me co-host this, this event. Um, it was such a pleasure to hear the dialogue between both of you. And That's... thank you to all of you for joining us. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank Conrad. You, thank you so much to our audience. <laughs> and next time, hopefully, it'll be live, uh, in person. It is live, yeah. but next time in person. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> with, with martinis. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to our subscribers. And um, please, if you don't own it already, please buy How to Love a Country at leftbankbookshop.com. Have a great night, everybody. Thanks for joining Thanks, us. Thank you. <laughs> Peace. <laughs>